bo nengo itzak eskerrak emateko izango dira. My first words are just to say thank you. Thanks to the Basque government and to Mr. Revelo for having invited me to this event. Thanks also to the MC. My first and most important prize was that I was the first education, regional education minister of the Basque government back in the day. And that was my, that's my most uh, proud achievement. That's why it's so nice for me to talk here at this event, at this event that's been organized by the Basque government because education for me has always been a matter of actually creating people who lead you, not people who follow you. And that's what the Basque government has been trying to do for many, many years. My greatest achievement from what I did in the Basque government is now to see what others have done that have come after me because they've gone beyond what I did and they've transformed us. And it's only those of us that trusted self-government could ever have believed in that we'd have managed to achieve this. The title of my presentation is Science, Future and Culture. And why do I say that? Well, because science, the word science, 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 but also the word techn technology. The fact of the matter is there is no disruptive technology if there's any basic science. The word science, the first thing that it brings to my mind is future and also culture, a humanist culture. That's why when I saw in the program that I was given by Mr. Revelo that he wanted me to link this to VET, Many uh, people, when they think about VET, think just about specialist uh, knowledge, professional knowledge. They don't think about human values. But the president and the speakers have given me 15 minutes more for my talk, so I'm going to use them. Because if you le link humanism and values of VET, I, that's for me the right thing to do because actually it goes to show the success of Basque VET, the fact that VET has been linked to human dignity, the fact that they believe in people, people that create this feeling of belonging, of quality, and not some kind of subordination to other branches of knowledge. And I'd like to congratulate you for that because it would be a mistake to deprive our youngsters of this source of beauty that gives us energy and inspiration. This is something that uh, the knowledge of classics gives us as far as we can. And I'm talking about classics in literature, in music, in fine arts. How can we deprive them of something that's going to be with them if they're lucky the rest of their lives? That would be a mistake. And school has to contribute to that. It has to contribute uh, to the creation of a harmonious personality, not just the creation of specialists. And that requires that we develop the ability to think critically, the ability to discern. And that's something that we should all support, independent thought, independent thought alongside specific technical upskilling. I've got a pointer here. Let's see if I can make it work. This is said by Ordine. What's the world that's ahead of us? Well. As Mr. Relevo and the minister and the president said, the world ahead of us is going to be rapidly changing, exponential change that are going to affect all fields of culture and economy and so forth, and that is going to have instant global reach. It's not just going to be words, the speed of change. How long did it take for the te telephone to reach a fifth uh, group of 50,000 people, a town of 50,000 people, 50 years. Uh, the mobile phone, 12 years. Facebook, three years. GPT, one month. That's the exponential change I'm talking about. This is really understood by the leaders of uh, those countries that are competing we all know that the competition now is between uh, liberal-minded countries and more autocratic-minded countries. 
now the battle for world uh, dominance at all levels is between the US and China. And the Chinese president is very clear in his ideas. They regard science and technology as their primary productive force. That's said by Xi Jinping. Talent is considered as their primary resource and innovation as their main driver of growth. It's not a bad way to think of things. And if you think about the demographics of China, and, and if you listen to what uh, Xi Jinping uh, says, you might be thinking, OK, it'll be China that wins this battle. And it may well be that they win the battle. The only advantage that we have, and this is something that's really important, uh, and that they don't have in China, is freedom. Freedom is the only thing that can make us win and not them. The 20th and 21st centuries are the centuries that are going to, where science and technology are going to triumph above and beyond everything else. But also progress in uh, women's rights, also awful genocides and uh, unparalleled suffering, catastrophes that we see every day. And even so, the 20th and 21st century, we've actually improved a great deal. It's the, it's the century of the triumph of science and technology and the application of knowledge to reduce our dependency on our natural surroundings and also to reduce pain, amongst others. This is really important to point out because sometimes people actually frown on science, but it's something that they do without the knowledge of what science is all about. Science can actually humanize society. This is the practical, useful side of science. A hundred years ago, less than a hundred years ago, groups started a speech to the British Scientific Society saying that we're on the verge of extinction. We can't feed the world with the amount of food that we have. Maybe science can change that. One thing is fixing nitrogen and uh, fixing ammonia using nitrogen. That's uh, difficult. That requires science, technology, and creativity. So this is Haber's uh, cycle, which is uh, fixing nitrogen through ammonia and uh, nitrogen and hydrogen in the atmosphere, which has allowed uh, to live uh, 4.5 uh, billion uh, individuals. For example, part of uh, China lives from an agriculture enhanced by fertilizer. And then we have the hybrid uh, rices that also allowed uh, the uh, living of more than one billion people. And Borlao, in fact, uh, was a Nobel laureate because of this. Sometimes we have the impression that this triumph of science and technology has not gone hand in hand with an equivalent uh, uh, triumph of ethics. And I say equivalent because it's very difficult to measure. But even though we've improved, we still have a lot more to be done. In 1980, 1 1.9 billion people were in extreme hunger uh, situation. Nowadays, only, let's say only, 800,000 uh, people of uh, this uh, population of 8 billion. So we've improved, but it's not tolerable that with the means we have, this is happening. This is an ethical disaster. So what is uh, science? If we speak about science in the academia, and I don't consider myself uh, someone traditional in academia, because in the academia, they start by saying that science is mainly a creative action that cannot be uh, defined or limited to a definition. Science starts when the Greeks abandon the myth and move uh, by curiosity, they use uh, reasoning to try and understand. 
and it is uh, based on uh, faith. It is curious, or maybe on optimism, but the faith of uh, believing that the material world uh, can be understood. There's no scientific evidence of this uh, being so, nor that our mind in this degree of evolution is capable of understanding it. But the scientists uh, have this faith that by working, we will be able to understand the immense uh, beauty and creativity of nature itself. It's what we call the uh, spell of uh, Ionian. And here we have the main core of humanism and science that uh, comes from the Greeks. Nowadays, are there any Germans here in the audience? Well, the key questions of the Greeks, the questions on human guide of the Greeks are giving uh, answers to in scientific labs. That's why it's important to point out that with this instrumental success of science, we have to look into how science has the capacity of uh, saying uh, and uh, giving information. And sorry, I'm getting a bit confused with my notes now. But no problem with that because I know this by heart. But I want to maintain some order with my notes. So as I was saying, it's convenient to look into the cognitive side of science and the capacity of working with the imagination. Science is much more than practical applications. It's an intellectual and human adventure that in the last years has changed the way in which we conceive the world in which we live and of ourselves. In my view, the structural uh, 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 way in which science has helped us is becoming the uh, work of art, the most important collective work of art of humankind. We've understand too that time and space um, is something that happened uh, many years ago and that we live in a small uh, planet in the outskirts of a galaxy in which there's hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of uh, stars in each galaxy. This immensity can be understood by a brain that also connects uh, billions of uh, neurons. So we are nothing, but at the same time, we are those that can understand that we are nothing. In fact, we've also understand that we are stardust. Uh, and when I explained this to my uh, daughter, when she was a child, she looked at me as, it was, as we talked about uh, prehistory. But this is a scientific truth. We are uh, stardust, and we are in a cycle that will bring us to become the dust of new stars. We've understood that continents move, and also that the last uh, um, elements in matter uh, have a symmetry. But at the same time, the world of things and the combination of all these elements, atoms, is non-finite, and there's always that many uh, possibilities. So science never ends, and human knowledge will continue to progress. The most important thing uh, regarding this is that we've also learned uh, something also very significant, that uh, everything is more than the addition of the parts that uh, has uh, technological uh, consequences. What's important and something that we don't usually mention is that this uh, triumph of science and technology in modern times comes from uh, the humanist uh, triumph. Curiosity, asking, wanting to know is what has allowed science to triumph in an exponential manner. These are two of the things that will be mentioned because at the end of the day, VET is skills plus uh, creativity and values, and they have to bring, be brought together. But when we increase knowledge exponentially, the, we, there is uh, a fear of uh, leaving uh, the other part uh, aside. There's a value of science that must be known by everyone, and that's uh, empirism. 
Uh, science is uh, fundamented and based on what's uh, uh, empirical. That's why the motto of the Royal Society is Nuyus in Berba. So it talks about uh, how uh, uh, we don't have to look into who is the uh, creator. But I would also want to give you an example of how science is culture, and that is uh, Biden with the uh, Webb telescope started to give us information on something that is happening at uh, uh, 30 billion uh, years in time. It is very difficult to imagine. If we looked at all the history of the universe in one year, all science and culture would be happening in the last five seconds of the 31st of December, just so you get an idea of the magnitude of this. But Biden communicates that science is a culture and it's something that the Americans are proud of. But going back to uh, empirical thinking, when Aristotle says that the heavier uh, bodies uh, fall uh, faster than lighter bodies, we can believe this or not. What is your view? Those of you that have studied science, I hope, know that this is not true. If there's people that believe the um, uh, Earth is flat, uh, probably some people uh, think that uh, apple uh, falls uh, faster than uh, uh, something that is lighter. Here, let's look at this uh, example uh, with the apple and the feather. So you can see uh, that the apple uh, falls uh, f uh, faster, but it falls in the air. But the discussion, what will uh, happen in a void environment. This is something that has we've been able to measure now, something that we couldn't measure in the past. Eight, seven, six, five, four. Cameras on, two, one, release. It's beautiful, isn't it? You could say that uh, if Aristotle is speaking about ethics, he, he is wrong because his ideas continue to be present and are continued to be discussed in many universities in the world. But science, at the end of the day, makes us be curious, opens our minds, and mainly, and something essential for science and for any educational system, it allows us to doubt. It gives us the freedom to doubt, which is intrinsic to science and should be, in my view, part of um, the educational system, the freedom to doubt. If I had to choose three terms now to speak about the exponential technological changes that uh, will be happening, disruptive changes, and link them to uh, the Basque country, I would talk about atom, gen, and uh, gene and bit. By saying atom, what I mean that is that in the previous um, century, we were able to see what was the structure of matter. We understood why atoms exist. We've understood through quantum physics that atoms are stable because matter is stable. Matter is uh, stable uh, because uh, we have the principle of interdimension and exclusion in quantum physics. And through quantum physics, we've understood uh, the whole electronic revolution. And now we have computers. And we talk about classic uh, quantum, but uh, classical computers are also quantum because electrons have followed the uh, rules of quantum physics. But now we're able to use uh, almost philosoph philosophical principles of quantum physics 
to be able to go to the second quantum revolution in which by using the entanglement, we're able to create computers. And this is something that is already being prototyped and is up and running with a very high speed that will affect AI and will also affect biomedicine. So this is a technology that can also be applied to uh, genes and uh, bits. And this is one of the wonderful things of a culture. We have the elements thanks to Coulomb's uh, uh, laws and to quantum physics. The Basques have the pride of being able to uh, contribute with uh, Wolfram. And in fact, uh, uh, President uh, Urkuyu made Bergara the town of science. We've always been religious uh, that um, and had important religious men, but not so much uh, scientists, but with a new policies put in place. I hope the person substituting me cannot say the same thing. And Mr. Manuel from Irujo said that the bass should be uh, proud even uh, for contributing to Wolfram and discovering one of the 92 elements. And then we have the artificial ones. So these are uh, the elements that make the universe because uh, uh, Wolfram is something that exists uh, here and wherever. And in the second quantum revolution, we are participating thanks uh, to the program uh, of the education uh, department. And I see Adolfo Moraes uh, here as uh, well as my friend, uh, Mr. Bildarat and uh, Amaya. So we should feel really proud. And in fact, we've been chosen as one of the seven centers to share our project. It is a project with risks, but things that are worthwhile are always risky. It would be even riskier not to be part of this project. So. Now we go on to uh, genes after atoms. Atoms, uh, uh, quantum physics, uh, quantum mechanics, and now um, the economy is based on uh, quantum mechanics. What about genes? Um, this uh, picture taken by a woman that was unfairly treated, in fact, this is the uh, way in which we saw DNA with x-rays. It allowed us to see the structure. And this is what's done in a small physics lab. Some uh, say that uh, Bergs are small. Well, it's enough if we have talent. And this uh, gave way to a big structure. And in the double helix structure of DNA, and in the way in which this uh, four I don't know if the laser is working, but the four letters that uh, make the alphabet of life, uh, thymine, guanine, adenine, and cytosine, are structured in the molecule is the way in which a generation transmits uh, uh, its features to the next one. This is the secret of life. It's changed both medicine and biology. And fundamentally now, with a technology that is uh, very revolutionary, and now we have what Jennifer Dona uh, has uh, done, as well as uh, Charpentier. This is what she said when she received the uh, Princess of Asturias Award for Science and Technology. And she said, I hope this makes uh, young people, but also governments, to support policies based on uh, promoting curiosity. And now we have the uh, bet the information. I'm sure that uh, Arevalo will give me a um, image that makes this more clear, but my technological capacity only allowed me to get the picture from 2013, and I'm sure there will be better examples of this nowadays. But in any case, the evolution of artificial intelligence and others is also creating an energy problem. In fact, a 7% of electricity is already consumed by big uh, databases and clouds and so on and so forth. By 2030, it will be a 30%. So the amount of energy demanded by the uh, technological revolution is something we should also bear in mind.
but this revolution uh, could mean many things. Uh, and those that uh, spoke before me uh, pointed this uh, out. And one of the things uh, that could happen and that I would like you to visualize in a uh, very easy manner. Kasparov uh, is won by the Deep Blue, and uh, Deep Blue nowadays can analyze uh, 200 million positions per second. But in any case, uh, Kasparov is uh, uh, one. But then we have AlphaGo, which is an AI machine that learns or teaches itself in four hours, also uh, combining traditional tests, even though modern versions uh, abandon this and learn from themselves. And of course, uh, they haven't lost uh, any games with uh, Deep Blue or uh, Stopfish that had already won Deep Blue. So uh, what was important here is that uh, they play in a different way. Casper says that Deep Blue changed the nature of chess. And uh, here a fundamental question arises regarding AI, because uh, if AI allowed us to learn different ways of learning and allow us to have knowledge that would be forbidden by our traditional intelligence, even though it could be a big one, then there's something to be analyzed there. And there's a new one now. I can't remember the name now, Corona or something like that. And that's where all scientific knowledge is uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, collected. It says called the Corona Go, I believe. And they use a computer that has a half an exaflop. And so you realize what this means. The famous uh, Iñak had uh, 500 operations uh, per second. And exaflop is uh, 10 to the 18th, uh, which is 1 uh, billion of uh, billions. And that machine is already being trained with uh, this uh, half uh, exaflop, and we have all the knowledge in the world stored and at the availability of researchers in one uh, second. And this could uh, mean uh, important uh, uh, solutions uh, for the future. It's not called Corona, sorry, it's called Aurora. In any case, and with this uh, three things, atom, gene, and uh, a bit with a uh, quantum computation and atomic engineering and ge genetic engineering and medicine based on individuals and uh, uh, AI, robotics. What I wanted to say with all this is that there are many possible disruptive technologies. But before such a distinguished audience, I would love to mention something that is sometimes forgotten. And that is that we not only have disruptive technologies, the uh, problem of ecology and of humankind is also based on the production of materials. These are the four materials more uh, um, used in the world. Uh, 4.5 tons of uh, cement, uh, 1.8 uh, tons of uh, steel, and 370 millions of tons of plastic, and 150 million tons of ammonia that uh, um, then uh, produces fertilizers and is essential for life. And all of these produce uh, CO2 and uh, waste products that will not be corrected by disruptive technologies. Therefore, sometimes it's very difficult to achieve some of the targets. For example, when we talk about uh, decarbonization and uh, CO2. And in fact, uh, China is also uh, using this. And I'm going to is show you what is the energy consumption per uh, person uh, per year in the world. If uh, you uh, that are all well fed, 
uh, consume around uh, uh, 2,000 uh, kilocalories per day, which would mean three gigajoules per person uh, per year. Three gigajoules uh, that uh, for a great part of humanity was not available and people were starving and living with 200 calories, which was horrible. But look at the evolution. Between 1950 and 2020, the U.S. has doubled its consumption per individual, very far away from the minimum uh, to survive of three gigajoules. Uh, Japan has multiplied it by five. So China per capita has multiplied it uh, by 120. So whatever we do here is significant, but it's not relevant if China is not uh, uh, collaborating. And in fact, we should continue uh, insisting on this. And yes, I'm doing uh, great with time. Now I would like to explain three features of uh, science before going to sp going on to speak about education. One of them is uh, long term, and the other one is creativity and a kind relationship with the administration. Something very significant and that is not always well understood. Fortunately, here it's well understood. Uh, usually, uh, university lecturers and those uh, like myself that have uh, uh, medals and awards uh, uh, like uh, to go against ourselves, but I'm an optimist and I believe things are being well done in the best governments and I don't lose nor win anything by saying so at my age. So first of all, let's look into the long term. We wouldn't have the Gioconda because the science is a collective work. We wouldn't have the Gioconda without Leonardo da Vinci. We wouldn't have Chiyida Leku. or we wouldn't have uh, the um, um, sculptors, uh, uh, and we, we wouldn't have the Mona Lisa from uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, nor we would have Tijira's works, but we wouldn't have the double helix uh, DNI structure uh, without a Watson and Creek or Newton. Someone else would have found it. It's a collective uh, work of art. That's why in science, we always need to respect those that came uh, previously, which is reflected in this wonderful uh, uh, quote of André Gide. All the waves of the sea um, have their beauty uh, because of the waves uh, before them. The same thing with the Basque uh, government and its uh, pioneers. And now, very quickly, let's look at that long term. This uh, double helix structure of DNA was found because of that uh, picture you see in the center, but it has its origin in uh, Thomas Young's discoveries and later on with Maxwell's uh, equations, evolution, and the fundamental dogma of uh, molecular biology, and that is that uh, uh, there is a transmission through a messenger RNA. That is like DNA, but instead with a double helix, a simple helix, and instead of a um, um, chemin acidine. And the um, with vaccines, we were able to see what was uh, happening. But first, we had a Kariko, a Hungarian immigrant and then to uh, Turkish people that use this idea. Carico changed one of the links uh, of nitrogen for one of carbon, stabilizing the molecule and allowing, amongst other things, a vaccine and uh, being a Nobel laureate. Just uh, changing uh, uh, nitrogen uh, uh, for uh, carbon and, of course, the adequate nitrogen uh, in the adequate space. So it's very difficult to estimate the years, effort, and knowledge, and education, and the number of people that have internationally collaborated, all the public-private uh, partnerships that allow us to get to a vaccine. Science is not something improvised. 
and that before a serious problem like the pandemic, we're able to solve this just by injecting millions of dollars. That's something that can only be done when a basic science is well known, as uh, this was done in the Manhattan Project. But that's something that hasn't been able to be done with a cancer. And now that basic science is being developed in all fields, we've been able to solve the issue of the vaccine on the short term. Therefore, the long term is fundamental. That's how it should be understood by politicians, mainly for those that come from abroad. Please allow me to explain that this is something that has been done in the Basque country. This is when the Basque government started <coughs> well, in any case, the pointer doesn't uh, uh, work, but I always uh, say that uh, science is what I explain to my daughter and technology what my daughter explains to me. So, what is the, this is the GDP percentage in science and technology in the uh, um, Basque country in 1981, that we already doubled uh, what we had in 1980. And in green, you see the evolution. There's a small drop. This has been recovered, and now it's even higher, 2.3. This is an impressive achievement that shows the long-term uh, policy that we should uh, congratulate ourselves about. So always looking at uh, and taking into account the long term. The second uh, term was uh, creativity because science is uh, creativity. I, I see that you are tired. I'm going to tell you a story. This is... Uh, uh, dangerous because uh, audiences, even smart audiences like yourself, don't maintain their attention after 15 minutes, according to studies from Cambridge University. But Cambridge and Harvard show that you focus on other things, uh, including what's in your mind right now. Therefore, I'm going to try and uh, not speak in such a serious uh, manner and uh, tell you a story. Some years back, and I've uh, told this story on many occasions, uh, the uh, president of a big uh, uh, company was in London, and he was going to listen to, or he had a uh, ticket to listen to Subert's uh, symphony. He couldn't go, so he gave the ticket to someone else in the company, uh, to the head of human resources. And uh, the head of a human, uh, he asked uh, the head of human resources, how was the symphony? And he said, you will get a report tomorrow, which uh, mm, really amused him. Why am I going to get a report on this? And we're really sorry, but we don't get any sound because of the music in the booth. And we're not able to, unfortunately, continue with the interpretation. But we will continue interpreting as soon as we get sound back in the booth. And we're really sorry for this. <laughs> Much effort was absorbed in playing demiquaver. This seems an excessive refinement. It's recommended that all notes should be rounded up to the nearest semiquaver. This was done. It would be possible to use trainers and low-grade operatives. No useful purpose is served while repeating with horns passages that have already been handled by the strings. If all such redundant passages were eliminated, the concert could be reduced from two hours to 20 minutes. And finally, they say that if Schubert had attended to all matters, he would certainly have finished his symphony. That's all he said. Thank you, but I'm sorry, we all, all we can hear is the music. We can't really hear what Mr. Echenique is saying. So the message is that in research, as in music, blind bureaucracy destroys creativity. And if that's truly valid, it must remain free from bureaucratic excesses. 
En definitiva, ¿qué más importante? Short. It's more important, even more profitable than regulations and fixing targets to science is to create an atmosphere, an environment in which creativity can freely flourish. And this can be achieved because Colmer, who's the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, said that the greatest discoveries in medicine and science come from basic questions, just simple questions. Can you imagine if you're looking for antimatter using a positron? This Nobody was thinking about that, and yet today this is something that is in all our labs. The third thing I want to talk about is, a, of course, a, a close relationship with administration so that researchers don't have to spend all their time on paperwork, on bureaucracy. For example, the deputy, deputy regional minister for research work for researchers, not researchers for the institutions. That's what I'd say to summarize this idea. And I have to say quite proudly that the Basque countries like that. I think that... Uh, Uh, Mr. Bilderatz, Mr. Moraes, and Mr. Skisabel actually deserve our thanks, especially my thanks, to make the, our lives a lot easier. Because the Basque government is an example that self-government has been decisive for this country, despite the fact that those that come from abroad uh, Uh, don't realize that actually the basic law hasn't been adhered to uh, for uh, the last 40 years. Otherwise, we'd look like German lender, not like a Spanish autonomous regions. But anyway, these three things, the long-term creativity and a close relationship with administration that makes our lives easier is what has made basic science in the Basque country something that's cutting edge in uh, Spain. We're very small. Uh, we're proud of being small. We're actually at the cutting edge of just the odd things. So we have the wealth of n notions as well, not just as the uh, wealth of nations. And now I'm now going to move on to the final part of my talk. I was going to be more scientific in my talk, but Seeing this attractive uh, title to this event, I thought I'd give my opinion on education. They're not very original opinions. Actually, they're quite old opinions regarding what I think should be done in education, because I'm sh convinced that, like in science, the basic in education, the basic side of education, that is values, the humanist side of things, is what's most profitable. really, are the most profitable. A small country can only survive if it has quality. In a world concert, a small country can only survive in this way. But general quality can only be achieved, at least the way I see it, if that country's priorities in has education at the top of the list, together with health, of course. And education, the problem with education is that there are different goals to education. And so if something goes wrong, it, education's always to blame. If there are too many suicides, education's to blame. This may well be lead to education system being overburdened with unrealistic expectations. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't overburden the education system with unrealizable expectations. The same goes for democracy. Education can't be the kingdom of those who are eternally unhappy. Some business men and women say, those that don't have much vision, what I want are people that are, can be employed tomorrow. Tomorrow. The thing is, if we train these people in something five years later, their needs have changed. So em directly employable people as a product of university is not a good approach. 
we researchers don't like change. We're resistant to change. We don't like things being changed. I can remember when I was very young, uh, the impact of seeing teachers in the U.S. going out and protesting against calculators. The strength of exponential uh, knowledge growth means that it's increasingly difficult to concentrate and get the basic side of things right and what we're trained in, in basic at a basic level right. But today, economies need an innovative spirit. They need, or the workplace needs, not just doesn't just require technical knowledge, but increasingly soft skills, our ability to think in an imaginative way, our ability to create creative solutions for complex problems. Creativity requires solving problems not by following just a simple recipe, by following a simple formula. So in short, education needs to produce people who are able to adapt to change and to new relations. And that requires two things in all systems and at all levels, technical knowledge and creative and ability and flexibility. Because technical skills are obvious. In this history of education, John Locke decided that technical skills were necessary to define a gentleman. For Napoleon, education was a training for a person to work in a centralized society. Escuelas de Francia a las 12 del mediodía se está enseñando logaritmos neperianos. Pero por un lado, so we need technical skills, but we also need creativity that Tolstoy talks about. Anybody that's read War and Peace, and I managed to finish it thanks to the lockdown during COVID. But for Tolstoy, they, he wanted to open the eyes of students to the marvels of the world. And Tolstoy's creativity is necessary. If we manage to do all of this, we'll get a great education system because education doesn't consist of just filling a glass. Plutarch said that education isn't filling a glass, it's lighting a flame. What I'm going to say now can be applied to university, but it can possibly be applied to VET as well. But what I'm always irritated by is the fact that education should help us not just to know, but to understand. Education isn't like fattening ducks to produce pate. Understanding means taking on board what we don't know, what is our own, so that once we accept that, we can adapt to what's unforeseeable, the unforeseeable problems of the future, so that we have the creativity to solve this. Education should help us create habits, ways of thinking, sensitive structures, so that we can adapt to future change. Education should be excellent. We need technical skills, but what's really basic of subjects and which will allow us to diversify, adapt, and the ability to face new challenges. And teachers, teachers in general, Personas formadas, bien formadas, y bien reconocidas should be people that are well-trained and well-recognized socially and economically. That's key. They need to be recognized, well-trained, and recognized economically and socially, and if possible, with vocation. And I know this is an old word, but I like it because what makes a teacher great isn't so much in getting disciples trained to follow them, but in training minds that can be critical in the future. We don't want followers. We want new governments that go beyond teachers. And teachers can do very little. The only thing they can do, I, the way I see it, is actually 
setting an example and awakening affection for knowledge. Values, of course, as well, but I uh, imagine that's going to be spoken about by other speakers. Having said that about education, just a final few words, which the Linda Cuddy, the president, and Mr. Arrows also have said. Science is the great triumph of humankind. Together with other things, for example, knowledge. Knowledge is uh, something that connects all things, but it's the great triumph of humankind. doesn't mean to say that we can overlook all the questions that are raised. We need to ask questions and we need to explain to society. Ethics isn't a scientific concept, but that doesn't mean that science has nothing to say about ethics. If we seek for truth, that means we think there is a truth, that it is the same for everybody. But ethics, and we scientists should collaborate with other fields and listen to these other fields because sometimes we go too far. You know Oppenheimer, that film is very fashionable. This is a sentence that Oppenheimer said. And he said it after the atomic bomb went off, when he changed his opinion on the hydrogen bomb. when And he changed it because he was so impressed by the beautiful technical solution for implosion And this sentence, I feel, is an ethical disaster. He says, when you see something that is technically sweet, you go ahead and you do it. And then you argue about what to do about it only after you've had your technical success. When we think of that now, we've got nuclear weapons which threaten the very existence of humankind. The only way of doing away or, or preventing people from using nuclear weapons is by doing away with nuclear weapons. We know that from the Ukraine war. This is really, really important. We need to be humans that have values so that we don't have any ethical disasters. Because the big challenges of mankind which are, of course, health, climate change, energy, an increase in tolerance and fundamentalism, inequality, because 1% of mankind has 82% of wealth, will only be solved with more science and more education and more value-based education and not with less of that. These are conditioning factors. They're not sufficient, but they're key. And that's why we scientists need to explain what we do. And we need to explain to society what science is all about. That's why we have a special program here, which is having a world impact. And this is being promoted by the Donosti International Physics Center which is called passion for knowledge, so that society knows the basic principles of science, what is science and what isn't, and the social and economic impacts of science. This is something which might sound trivial that anybody can do, but no. it has, you have to train for it. I fail in communicating science. When I was talking to my daughter about the periodic table and explaining to her how beautiful it all was, and I asked her, Maria, isn't it great? Yes. Have you got any questions? And she replied to me, yes, Dad. Do you think the ice cream shop's going to be open? So that's my failure in communication. That's what they're like. So I'll finish. I'm almost on time, more or less because it's awful when a speaker gets enthusiastic um, to carry on and it's in inverse proportion to the enthusiasm of its audience. But going back to leaping, our future is science, technology, as productive forces, as talent, as a resource. And the only way of attracting talent is having attractive projects in professional fields, and also in culture and in ethics. We need big 
major research centers, but also societies that find it attractive to come here. The trend is to invest in what's useful. Of course, that needs to be done, but we need to have a long-term view. The great art historian Gombridge, uh, when criticizing utilitarianism, used a metaphor that I like a lot, which I'm going to read. Those that have in their hands the strings of uh, the purse strings like to say that he who pays the musician chooses the song. But a society that only is concerned about practical knowledge will have a society, will be a society when there's no musicians. And you choose a song and there'll be silence. Otherwise, you're never going to hear music again. It's scientists' duty today to flee from excess utilitarianism. What used to be a luxury in the past is now something that's urgent. We need to include in the education system a passion for knowledge, a passion to learn. That's what's really useful. It's decisive to increase the social prestige of science and knowledge in general, all kinds of knowledge, because knowledge is something that increases with use. And it's going to be the uh, raw material of the economy. It's not like soap. The more you use it, the more it disappears. No. The more you use it when it's the case of knowledge, the greater it gets. In pandemic, we spoke about the need to show support to the past, to our elderly, those people that have given us so much in the past. But we also should be supportive of the future because the problems that our children, that our students are going to face are far more difficult than those that we had to face and therefore we are under the obligation to provide them with the material and spiritual and knowledge tools so that they can face this. Never should we underestimate their ability, their skills, because each generation always underestimates the imagination of the next one. They will say, oh, no, you don't know anything, Dad. When I talk to my daughter's I realize that they're actually far better trained than we were. The only thing I have against the future generations is that I'm not a part of them. I'm almost at elderly status. What a shame. But now I will finish. I encourage you to face the future optimistically, Montaigne. I was always a pessimist, and he said that who, whoever fears suffering is already suffering from fear. How ridiculous is it that we fear things? Because modern technology is going to be difficult to deal with, but we have the tools, and we'll look at things optimistically. Whoever wants to expect to enjoy is already enjoying the expectation so thanks to the regional minister of education our president as well so i wish you all the very best in this conference thank you